It's time for Twig, This Week in Google, episode 67. Kevin Purdy joins Gina and Jeff. We'll talk about the new Facebook mobile announcements, uh, the moves from uh, Google to Facebook for a couple of big players and a whole lot more. This Week in Google is next. It's Chipotle time. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. You'll find all the Twitch shows on your Roku box, Android, and BlackBerry phones at all Yahoo Widget TVs powered by Mediafly. For more information, visit twit.tv slash Mediafly. This is Twig. This Week in Google, Episode 67, recorded November 3rd, 2010. It's just a guacamole platform. This Week in Google is brought to you by GoToMeeting, the affordable way to meet with clients and colleagues. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com slash twig. And by Ford and Voice Activated Sync, featuring true hands-free calling, turn-by-turn -turn directions, 911 assist, and more. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by Gazelle. The easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. Don't just sell it. Gazelle it. For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to Gazelle.com. Bonus code TWIG. It's time for TWIG this weekend. Google, the show that covers Google, the Googleverse, the cloud, and today, Facebook, joining us, Gina Trapani from her home in San Diego. She blogs at smarterware.org and is also a, a blogger for Fast Company. Go to fastcompany.com slash work smart for her latest series of videos. Hi, Gina. Hi. Good to see you. Good to be here. Yay. Good to see you, too. Yay. Yay. Also here, Jeff Jarvis, who is at the post office. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> well, he's a little I'll more than the post no office. Jokes. He's at the, he's at the uh, world headquarters of the post office. At the office of the inspector general. Wow. I love That's a great title. The Isn't it great? It sounds something I like... I asked, a, do, they, do they call him general? They said no. It's so Gilbert and Sullivan. Yeah. I am the merry <laughs> model of a modern inspector general. Uh, Jeff is a blogger at blogbuzzmachine.com, professor, tenured professor of journalism at the City University of New York, and the author Your of the... tax dollars at work. <laughs> Not mine, just yours. And the author of this fine book, What What the Hell Would Google Do Now? What? <laughs> Maybe you should do a sequel, What Should Google Do? That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually working on a new book about uh, public and private parts. It's called Public Parts. Also joining us, we, we always love having uh, him on the show, Kevin Purdy. Who Hello. is a blogger at Lifehacker and also... Are, what, what's your title at Lifehacker? I am a contributing editor. So that's more than a blogger. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's what that is. Yes. yes. I'm more than a blogger. That's, that's what all those complex doc, tax documents mean. <laughs> He's also the author of The Complete Guide to Google Android at completeandroidguide.com. Yes. It's a real book too, though, not just a web book, right? It is. Uh, paper, ebook, uh, EPUB, and all that. In every form, but a true mm -hmm. expert on Android, which is a good thing because we always talk a lot about Android. We're Android fans here at the, uh, at the old show. Um, we are running a little late today because there was a big event at Facebook headquarters, their Facebook mobile event. I'll summarize, and then uh, you guys can uh, talk. First of all, just a, a, a personal note, Mark Zuckerberg uh, let it off. He's lately been taking the mic more and more with uh, Facebook events and actually showed himself really well. I thought he was articulate. Uh, um, he came off as smart, funny, and, and actually got off a good one because at the end of the Q&A, somebody said, how come you don't have a, uh, a mobile app for the iPad? And he said, iPad's not mobile. <laughs> really in kind of a dismissive tone. That's not mobile. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Uh, I thought he really came off very well. He introduced, uh, he talked a little bit about the fact that mobile has become bigger and bigger for the Facebook platform. 200 million mobile users this year, up from 65 million a year ago. He mentioned that they're going to be on every platform. Of course, they're already on Android and iPhone, but Windows Mobile 7, BlackBerry, 
uh, Nokia, and uh, he also really underscored the mobile web, uh, saying, you know, a lot of these phones use browsers, and that's and we're there too. I'm sure that's his solution for the iPad. And announced new versions of uh, the Facebook application, the official Facebook application for both iPhone and, iPhone and Android. The Android one is out now, 1.4, and has added places. So it's got parity with the iPhone. It's added groups. And I imagine somewhere buried in there are some of the other features they announced. They had three big initiatives they announced. One is a single sign-on. They already have Facebook Connect on the web. As you browse around, you want to log into many sites. You just press the Facebook Connect button and use your Facebook credentials to log into the site to create an account. Now that will be available on mobile. They're calling it a single sign-on. Uh, he also uh, they, they also announced uh, a uh, change to the Places API, the Location API, it previously, I didn't know this, it was only readable, but now applications, and everybody's apparently on board with this, including Foursquare, Gowalla, Looped, uh, and Yelp, the big location players, all can write to the Facebook API. So in the past, you know, you, I, in fact, this is how I do it. I log into fa to a Foursquare, and because I use the Foursquare application on Facebook, it automatically adds that to my stream. But it doesn't update my location on Facebook. It doesn't integrate very tightly. Now it will. Now they have uh, parity with Facebook itself in terms of location logs and logins. And that ties to a new Facebook platform, one in which, by the way, Mark Zuckerberg says we're not going to make any money on, which surprised me. Phenomenal. Called Deals. And the idea of Deals is very much like Foursquare. Yelp just added the same thing, which is when you check in to a location, the, the owner of the location can offer you a deal. And there's actually kind of a nice little side effect that, uh, that to the way Facebook does its places where you could check in other people. One of the deals could be, for instance, check in with three of your friends and you all get a free cup of coffee. So really some real potential to, uh, to, to, to monetize this. And, and yet Mark says, no, nah, we just want to build a platform. We're not going to make any money on that. That surprised they're, you? They're not getting a cut at all of that? No cut at all, he said. And now this is advertising on it. Pardon me? You mean put advertising on it, right? Foursquare probably gets a cut. I don't know. I don't know. Nobody's said. And yes, uh, Jeff, to answer your question, they can make money on it because they are uh, certainly going to incur it. You know, somebody said, well, how will you know if there's an offer? And there's several ways. One is the, the store can buy an ad that'll show up. Uh, the other way is if your friend takes advantage of the offer, it shows up in their stream, which could show up in your live stream. And the third is the one you'd expect, which is if you check in or you're, you know, to that that place, it will then pop up. They said they're very careful. They do not want to start pushing ads at you due to the proximity of a place, which I think that's, that would be a concern for everybody if all of a sudden you want. It would be neat to be able to say, oh, here I am at the mall. Any deals around me? I think you can do that, Jeff. I, that was the implication. Yeah. Okay. So that you could say, I'm here. What is, what's around? But you ask. And, but you have to the ask. Difference. They can't push it. And so isn't it right. true also, Leo, then that, that you, uh, they provided a tool so that if I'm, you know, Jeff's Cupcake Store, I can just put a deal up there? Yes. Now, right now, it's only That's available cool. to people who are their beta partners. Uh, and they and they have a number of beta partners. But the implication Chipotle. is... Chipotle! Yeah. I'm going to get Chipotle <laughs> yeah, deals. baby! Woo! I'm so Finally. happy! I can't <laughs> wait for those Applebee deals. But presumably, eventually, everybody can do it, as they can with Foursquare. <laughs> Olive Garden! Breadsticks for all! <laughs> well, Jeff is a known Chipotle lover, so his excitement is especially... Oh, it's not specious? <laughs> I thought he was mocking me. Oh, no, no! He I want shows free up rock, early man. to avoid the line. Wait a minute. Jarvis special. You go to the Jeff Jarvis early bird special at Chipotle? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm mad that I go to this one so often. I'm not there yet. I should at least be on the friggin' city council. <laughs> That's what they need. They need, yeah. a, they need a host of titles. You could be the vice right, I mayor. I need to be parks and rec director at my, my nearby Chipotle. <laughs> That's what I want to be. <laughs> what is it about Chipotle? I mean, I'm sorry. I hate to digress here, but uh, what is it about Chipotle's that you oh. like so much? Love Chipotle. Oh, yes. You too? Yeah. I, I do. Now, see, I do. Gina, I could, I could believe that because of Jeff because he's in New York where you probably can't get a good burrito. But you're in I'm freaking San Diego. It's true. Even here in San Diego, which has some of the best burritos in the country, 20 minutes from the Mexican border, I still do go to Chipotle. That's the whole the whole vibe. The food's really good and, and, uh, and it's affordable. And yeah, it's really good. It's popular here I'm, for I've, sure. I've never been to a Chipotle. <gasps> oh, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to fix that. Leo, are you on American? Kind of do, do we have Chipotle's here? <laughs> yeah, there's one nearby. They're down in San Rafael. I could go. 
Maybe we'll do a, you a, gotta a go. field trip. You gotta trip. go. I, I get the vegetarian bowl, a little bit of rice, a lot of black beans, and then you pick which salsa you want, and I get, you know, cheese and guac, and I'm a very happy guy. Yeah, the salsa and the guac are really good. Two best indicators of a good Mexican yeah. rice. Yeah. Burritos are distillery mechanisms for guacamole, really. Absolutely true. true. And sour cream if you really want to get crazy. It's just an API to get a guacamole. <laughs> That's a, it's a guacamole <laughs> platform. It is. <laughs> the guacamole platform. And now, and now to bring us back, that's what this is all about for Facebook. And very yeah. clearly now they're saying, we're the platform. When you log in, you log in with Facebook. When you check in, you check in with Facebook. Uh, this explain that, wait, wait, explain that to me. So, so if I log into the Facebook app on my phone, I've now logged into other apps? No. And no. you, you see this already with Facebook Connect. When you go to Yelp yeah. and it says you want to log in or press the button. What's if the you're, difference? It's exactly the same. It's just never been available on mobile. Mobile, remember, mobile oh, doesn't... I see. Yeah, mobile doesn't use the same... It's not using... Unless you're using the browser, it's not using HTTP. So these mobile apps communicate differently with Facebook and, and with each other. So all, all it's... I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can help me with this, uh, Gina or Kevin, because you guys might know better. But it sounds like they've provided essentially an API for using... Facebook Connect, but not over HTTP. I, I'm a little confused, too, because on Android, and maybe Gina can clarify, it sounds like it's for web apps mostly, because on Android, Twitter clients, uh, Foursquare, whatever app you're using, usually you set up your username and password once in the settings, and then you're done. Right. Uh, you're gonna, you know, until you uninstall it. Um, it, it. So it sounds like maybe they're using Facebook Connect to um, let you log into web apps, I'm assuming? No, no, I think this is... Well, it's functionally the same. I'm honestly okay. not sure. I was also going to ask you guys about that. Well, I think it's like, like okay, so uh, I think it's like Open ID. So um, if you go to a, use an app, you could log in with a nat with your native password and, and log in for that app. Or the app will some apps will now start presenting. I haven't seen any yet, but I'll look around tonight. Presenting, or just as they do on the web, or use Facebook, and then if I, now this is the question: if you've already authenticated with Facebook, is that sufficient? Probably it is. Maybe they renew it every few weeks, whatever. But it, the way they showed it on the screen at the event is it pulls up that kind of, you've seen it all, we've all seen it before, connect with Facebook, and you have to press an allow, don't allow. It shows you what permissions. They say that the permission, and this is very interesting, and this is, again, this is the platformization of Facebook. Your Facebook permissions now apply to your transactions with this third party. Ooh. And mm. now, so that does make it does make it into your kind of publicness tool. Oh yeah, so right? you so so Facebook is not Facebook. You know, I think from the beginning it should have branded itself as a sharing tool, and so now you have the rules of your sharing. That's very cool, isn't that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I I can't find any real problems with this except maybe the potential security issue. You know, the problem with a single sign-on is potentially if it's not implemented properly. I think if you lose your password, you're screwed. I mean, if you're signed in a, in a web browser on a desktop now to Facebook and you've also connected to other accounts, if you open another tab and go to one of those other web apps Boom, that you you're have in. connected, you're in. Yeah. yeah, there's no yeah. there's no extra step, right? I think they're saying you just don't want to have to keep typing your passwords in on your mobile phone, right. you know, pecking away on your but, phone. Right, but I, exactly. right. I, right. I don't, and iPhone users don't either, do they? I mean, you're, the apps that you've installed keep your username and password. I, I mean, I unless you saying. want to be logged out all right. the time um, I see what you're or something saying. like for, you know, mint.com, I don't stay logged in, but um, you know, they're, the, the apps are usually just preloaded and that's why you use apps. I thought, uh -huh. yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, but every he time was right he was... that typing in typing in usernames and passwords on a mobile website is a pain in the rear, and they, they right. demonstrated that during the um, during the presentation. But I, I most apps usually just hold your login information until you need to you know enter it again after X months or something. Of course, we all install so many new apps. Maybe it's just you know that's because it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> right for you, Leo, it does make total sense. Yeah. Um, and for anyone who's trying out a lot of apps, yeah, I guess if I. For using an app for the first time, it would be pretty easy to just hit the the blue Facebook Connect and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think so. If you're building an app, guys, Gina, developer lady, uh, you build this into your app now because it'd just be foolish not to, right? It's just a super easy way to sign in, right? You don't want yeah. people to have to sign in, go through the painful process of the email, the name, and the so. So it is a super easy way to sign in. So yeah, if if your if your audience is on Facebook, and most likely they are, because who isn't? then it makes sense to do this for an app, app developer, for sure. Yeah. They, they do have, it turns out, a Facebook Connect for iPhone and Android. So this is not that. This is in addition to that. 
Um, hmm. So it is for, you know, the first time you log into an app. The partners that they announced with were Zynga, Groupon, Looped, Scavenger, which is actually kind of a cool uh, mm -hmm. location-based play that hasn't gotten a lot of attention but deserves it, Yelp, Flickster, and Booyah. <laughs> I like the name. What is Booyah? I don't know. No idea. Yeah. So uh, I guess it's, it's bringing Facebook Connect, the web-style Facebook Connect, to standalone apps. And I imagine, of course, once you've got that connection between the app and Facebook, there's all sorts of stuff going on now back and forth between it and Facebook. You can now like and, and, uh, right. and do other stuff. And uh, presumably, I guess the real question and the thing that will really upset users if, is if all of a sudden more and more of your activity outside of Facebook is streamed to your Facebook activity stream. I mean, it's a, my activity stream is already where the algorithm jammed. comes in, though. That's that's where it's gonna it's gonna you know not put stuff in there. The, the, you know, that's the the essence of the newsfeed algorithm is that it's selective. Yeah, I always watch the live algorithm, which is not selective. It's just whatever is yeah. happening. But I think increasingly people are going to say, no, no, we'll watch the uh, new the uh, the selected one. And I guess that's based on the number of likes and comments. So you if you if you just get your news feed, you don't see everything. You just see the things that people are interacting with. My selfish that's, you know, nightmare is that I'll. Is that I'll tell my wife, you know, oh, having leftovers for lunch. Yeah. And then she sees Kevin picked up a coupon at Chipotle. Yeah. And then she'll realize my sham. If that's all you're worried about, Kevin, I think you're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. I, well, right. More, more, you know, more if, 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 if I'm having lunch at the, uh, the chicken ranch, that might be another problem entirely. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and Kevin like just saying, orders. hopefully the, the <laughs> algorithm will be smart enough to not show my friends that. But my as, friends shouldn't care. As Eric Schmidt so wisely said, if you're not doing anything you're ashamed of, there's nothing to worry about, is there? Mm, shame. Shame. <laughs> Delicious shame. shame. Google kills shame. <laughs> there is no more shame. It's dead now. We talked, there was another, they didn't, you know, there are a couple of things they didn't mention. And, uh, in fact, looked like they actively pre prevented journalists and uh, uh, stream viewers from asking. One was this Fire Sheep issue, which is this really significant security issue. I installed it on my Firefox. It's a plug-in from CodeButler.com uh, that you install on your Firefox. And what it does is it traps these tokens, these cookies that Facebook sends. You know, when you go from page to page on Facebook... It has to authenticate you at each page because a browser doesn't know that you're the same person or not. So every web app, right? Every I web mean, app. Every web app does this, yeah. So instead of saying, well, here, what's the login? What's the login? Which would be incredibly annoying. The first time you log into Facebook, it sends you a cookie, which is, a, which is an identifying token that has a limited, you know, has an expiration date, usually, you know, just the session. And then from now on, from page to page, the page just says, well, are, what's the token? And you say, swordfish. And it says, okay, it's you. Well, it's always been possible using hacker tools like Kane and Able to capture that token in an open access spot. FireSheep just makes it really easy. So I put it on my laptop. I go to my local coffee shop. I see a list and pictures even of everybody who's on Facebook, Yelp, even Google, not Google Mail because it uses HTTPS, but the rest of Google. I can see their pictures from those sites. I can double click them. So if I see, I see a Gina, oh, there's Gina Trapani. Oh, she's cute. I double click her. I'm in her Facebook page. I can leave stuff as her. All without a password. Yes, I actually reached reached out to Fast Company directly to get their statement on this because I wrote a story about Fire Sheep for Fast Company, and um, they this is exactly what they told me. They said we've been waking, making progress testing SSL across Facebook and hope to provide it provide it as an option in the coming months. As always, we advise people to use caution when sending or receiving information over unsecured Wi-Fi networks. Uh, check out the Facebook security page, FTC's on God Online, on Gov website, blah blah. Be careful about the information you access or send from a public wireless network. To be on the safe side, assume that other people can access any information you see or send over a public wireless network. <laughs> that's kind of missing can, the boat because that's not yeah. what's that's not merely what's happening here. No, it is. And then he says, you know, additional points. Facebook logins are always encrypted. We knew that. We offer session control feature that lets people view all their active Facebook sessions. But who looks, you know, who, who's looking at that every moment as they as they use it? So you know, there, yeah, this is a problem with every website, right? Because H, every HTTP request is completely independent of the one pre, before it or after. They're like, it's stateless. It doesn't know if you're logged in. So it has to, every single request does have to include login information. But that information should be encrypted. And this is a, this is a problem that 
lots of you know people have known for a really long time. I mean, Google knew they just what they encrypted Gmail, but you know they just did that pretty recently. Uh, and by so the way, they still haven't encrypted anything else. So if somebody uses FireSheep, they can see I'm on Google. They can go look at my web history. They could change my search settings. They could do a yeah, lot of things. Yeah, that's right. Right. So Google wasn't totally immune either. Gmail, yes, but not but not just a regular Google account. So you know, this is a good thing. Websites are gonna are gonna secure this. They're gonna start transmitting cookies over SSL. Um, it should have happened a really long time ago. I, I'm actually glad that Eric did this. Yeah, it forces the uh, issue. Exactly. It does even even though there will be collateral collateral damage for sure, Lots especially on of college it. campuses. College yeah. campuses. That's exactly yeah. where it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, if you are in a coffee, an open access coffee shop and you logged into Facebook, you, I think you, half a million people have downloaded this thing. You can pretty much assume that somebody could log in as you. I, I uh, just as a demonstration at the cottage, log, you know, said, uh, logged in Lisa's account and said, uh, I, this is Leo. I just hacked Lisa's account on her status message. I mean, it's really, it's not uh, a good thing. However, this is presumably something you would want to ask Facebook. Yes. Uh, no, nobody in present asked about it. And uh, I'm told by one of our chatters who asked the question in the chat that that question was immediately deleted from chat. So I think this is something that Facebook did not want to deal with. I talked to Steve Gibson, our security guy, and he, uh, it's his opinion that the web apps, this single sign-on for web apps is not impacted by FireSheep because web apps, uh, rather uh, mobile apps are not like web apps. They do not use HTTP. They do not use HTTP tokens. So it, oh. would, it does not affect web apps. And in fact, that was my experience just empirically. I, I could not see people who were logged on to Facebook, for instance, through a web app. I could see if they use Safari. On the whole, uh, though, you yeah, can see it that... Uh, is, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead, Jeff. Is there a fix that uh, you can make to a browser that fix this, fixes this? There are some... There's a, there are a couple of uh, uh, Firefox plugins. Uh, HTTPS Everywhere is the one that people recommend that will kind of fix it but really and 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 you can tell the open access spot owner as i did with my my local coffee shop please turn on wpa2 which she did that fixes but wouldn't it. it be a lot easier if it were if, i mean what i'm asking is is it is it logically possible is it in the realm of possibility that you could make a change in the architecture of chrome or firefox no it re no. ultimately requires yep. SSL be offered by these sites. Facebook has to turn on. Now, Google did an interesting thing. The day after FireSheep came out, they posted on the Google blog, by the way, it was trivially easy for us to turn on HTTPS on Gmail. It uses very little server resources. They said less than 10K per login, less than 1% of CPU to turn on SSL. Their message was to counter the kind of common misconception that SSL is uh, CPU intensive or resource intensive, that it isn't. It costs us nothing. Everybody should do this. So and yet you can still see Google accounts and FireSheep? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah, they turn it on for Gmail only. Well, you know, well that's the soft spot. But if, if for instance, uh, I could probably log into your Wave account. I could probably log into uh, Google Groups. I think Rub Wave it in, Leo. Rub yes. it in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess I won't be logging into your Wave account. <laughs> well, because oh. my Wave account won't be around much longer. <laughs> yeah. But Buzz is protected because Buzz is Gmail essentially. Interesting. Other I, than know, uh, um, on, on the whole, though, I'd say Mark Zuckerberg was much more um, uh, prepared for um, opening up to questions and then having the next five questions immediately be privacy. Um, he yeah. was ready <laughs> to answer the questions. And I think about, he handled it very well, don't you? Yeah, and location. Uh, you know, right away, someone asked about the uh, the privacy matters around uh, you know the coupons and the local coupons, and he said, you know, right away, this is opt in. You have to be. Uh, like you said, like searching for those coupons uh, locally that nobody can push them to you unless you, right. you know, like Chipotle and want to be receptive was, to Chipotle. He did the little Mark Zuckerberg dismissive thing yeah. where he goes, um, uh, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, you're so stupid. No, of course not. But it didn't catch him off guard. I'm saying no, he, knew he was prepared. That right away. He's just, he's, yeah. you know what, he, I, I, say, I, I don't know if he's gone through media training or what, but he's much more. You, you don't see the sweaty, sweaty Zuck anymore. No, He's and, and, well, which wasn't that long ago, you're right. But, but I remember when I first saw him at a public event, um, I think it was the Foursquare Conference in New York, which is coming up, which is closed. And, and, and he's just, the deer in the headlight thing is because he's scared. Yeah. And I think he's just, he's, he's gone through such hell now yeah. that, you know, what's okay, case? So what's going to happen to me? And he's more like the Zuckerberg that I've seen when I've, you know, met him face to face. Very confident, very smart.
Yeah. If anything, he has that little arrogance thing that uh, Jobs has, Bill Gates had, where he's, you know. I'm name sorry. a mogul who doesn't. Right. That's right. You like, need that. You have you to have that. If you one mogul no. or politician, nah, stick with mogul, who doesn't have that. Right. Well, if if any politician has it, it's it's phony. Actually, yeah. I can name one. I can yeah. name one. Who? You. <laughs> I'm not a mogul. That's why. <laughs> if, wait till I get to be a mogul, and then I'll treat you all like crap. <laughs> the crap you are. No, it's really true. You know, I, I, you've met far more of these people than I have, Jeff. But you have to have a certain right. grandiosity and and, and yeah. courage of spirit to be uh, to be these guys. Right. I'm not surprised. I, so. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But they really do think they're the smartest guy in the room. I mean, it's, it's always apparent. Of course, Gina, you yeah. think, you know you're the smartest woman in the room. Oh, <laughs> oh of course. what? Of course. I, just, I wasn't even listening you, to you. You walk minions. into any room. <laughs> yeah, <we're, laughs> sorry, didn't mean to, to, oh. Did this disturb my deep thoughts? I did, I'm apparently. The <laughs> 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 I, you know, I, I was going to say earlier, like, Facebook had grown up. It's a mature platform. Yes. I think that Mark is growing up. You know, I think about that, that dorky picture of Bill Gates when he was, like, 19, draped over that desk that was taken for, like, oh, TV Jesus. or something. Yeah. You know, like, someday we're going to be, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to be watching those, you know, oh, interviews yeah. with Zuckerberg when he was sweating right. at, at 21, and we're, and we're going to laugh. I mean, he, right. he he's growing up, and it's maturing. And, you yeah, know, I think about the way that Mark uh, presents Facebook and like the way that the Facebook staff kind of talks about the platform and the way that the Twitter uh, leaders kind of talk about Twitter and and uh, on the Twitter side they they all haven't seemed to they, it's like they're all kind of still in awe of you know how big it grew and how fast it's going and what it does yeah, and it seems time like to Facebook, get over that guys yeah they need to they need to get over that and Facebook yeah. has a little bit more of a maturity about it and well, Zuckerberg is winning me winning me over a me little too. bit I have to see yeah me yeah the one to change what if you play us back for what, six months ago? I was yeah. furious uh, with them. Yep. Eight weeks ago, probably. <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Recently. <laughs> now, <laughs> all right, let me go back to that old uh, disgruntled Leo. I have to say that this is clearly, I mean, Facebook's just saying we want everything on the web to go through us. And we and maybe we won't get that on the web, but boy, we're going to get it mobile. Uh, you, you know, use our check-in, use our, use our location, you, you know, use our uh, APIs. Uh, is there anything wrong with and that? Are you the switching cost becomes harder and harder and harder? And the right. next time, Leo, you're going to think twice before you quit Facebook, right? I can't. You know what? I'm glad now that I'm a member, just so I can try this stuff out. They're insinuating Leo, themselves. Let me into ask you, Leo. Oh, sorry. No, no. Go ahead, Jeff. Quick question. So you cleared out all your friends, and you had to rebuild your friends. What's the what's the overlap? How did that structure work? Well, I was I had misused Facebook from day one, and I I friended everybody, right? So I was at the maximum of five thousand. I've deleted the everybody. Uh, I have a fan page, which I don't know what that's at now. It's still not five thousand, and I have a friend page, which is at two hundred. Uh, it's just real. It's actual friends. It's you guys. It's actual friends. Actually, it's not Kevin. I don't know you, but it's the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it's. But actually, Gina, you're not my friend. I, I'm. I'm a fan, but I don't think you're my friend. Yeah, we have to. I'm kind of hidden on Facebook. Yeah, I'll. I'll friend you. That's the right way to be, though. I think it's just use it that way, especially now. But at the same time, I'm glad. Now I have to say, there's scary stuff on Facebook. Look at this. This is one of the things that Facebook just launched. Is this uh, view you and another person? So here's Molly Woods. My friend Molly Woods page. I click this link that says view you and Molly. And then it shows all the interactions we've had. It I think shows that's the, cool. Well, it's, it's a little scary because... Everything now, new is scary, Leo. But, but it kind of implies a relationship where maybe none exists, you know? Um, these are pictures... Oh, that's true. You know, uh, like, well, I, I did it with Tom Merritt and Veronica Belmont. Now, now, Tom's wife, Eileen, is my esteemed producer... But if you looked at this, you might think that Tom and Veronica had something going on. <laughs> it's the internet never forgets. Like the thing that happened in 2007 could look just as legitimate as the thing that right. happened yesterday. Whereas the thing that happened yesterday is more important to you because as humans, things fade in our memory and relationships cool. But on the internet, they don't. Right. right? You either are or you aren't. And Neil and I were talking about this just the other day. Um, I think it's really cool to have this sort of memory of, of interactions that you've had with someone. But it also, I, I agree with you, Leo, it, it's this... It's this, you know, permanent record of something that happened forever ago that might not be as important there's as no it seems. There's it, no contextualization at all. Yes. And this, this to me, in a nutshell, is exactly what I like and dislike about Facebook. Because on the one hand, this is Mark Zuckerberg saying, well, your connections are important. And I can, we can show you stuff you can't see in any other way. We're showing this is the social graph. Isn't that cool? And his attitude personally is, isn't that cool? And I think he's a little insensitive 
to the feelings that people might have that yeah, it's cool, but it's a little creepy, too. Right, but, but you Leo, keep you know, suggesting like, my ex-wife to be my friend. Right, you know? it's my ex-wife. That was a long time ago. It was a horrible divorce. Yeah, thing. but you don't have that in there. Right. Yeah, you ought to be able to opt out of a certain link. But but then again, the logic is that if this person is already your friend, you said they're your friend, so did you right. mean this? Right. Your friend? right, right. I have ex-girlfriends uh, in there. I'm not sure I should. You yeah, know? that's true too. Of course, um, of course, I'm so old. All of those relationships are pre-Facebook. I, it's not. I'm not. For me, it's not a big deal. But if, but I guess for my kids, it might be a huge deal that every previous relationship is documented on but Facebook. Isn't it like newsfeed? It's basically there already. You could. I, I think you could find it. Oh yeah. It's not that you it couldn't. Easier. It's that the the computer and the abilities of Facebook to bring disparate data together. This is the whole privacy issue. You know. It's the same argument you could make about, you know, I remember interviewing uh, somebody 20 years ago where you give them your, your, your zip code. I can't remember the name of the company, but it was a, they, everybody bought their database and they could tell you what magazines you were likely to subscribe to, what car you were likely to drive. They knew all sorts of information about you just from your zip code. The difference is now because of all these big databases and the ability of computers to instantly correlate data, it's not that it wasn't there before. But now they can. Now it's brought together in new and interesting ways, and of course, that's what Zuckerberg loves. Yeah, um, Alexis uh, Magical at uh, the Atlantic uh, Tech Channel, um, the the Atlantic's kind of tech uh, face on the web, has a a great post he just put up very recently. Uh, why Facebook Places will be better than Foursquare, and oh, that really is. answers. It. Yeah, and it really answers the question I've been asking about which one of these. Um, you know, check-in services could really float above the others. And he says, basically, uh, if I'm, you know, hanging out in the Mission District and I see that three of my friends are at a bar, I'd rather see that, at, you know, three of my Facebook connections uh, often go there or are there right now. I'd rather see that right on the top than, you know, just what happens to be GPS location close to me. And um, he says that just by by the, the data mining that Facebook is going to be able to do, I shouldn't use that phrase. But yep. the, oh, that's <laughs> the, the phrase. The relational um Data mining. The, the relation, the relational uh, relationship that's going to be able to mine uh, through your Facebook check-ins and your friends and everything. Right. It's going to be a much. It could be a much better Foursquare that knows better what you're. I'm more likely to walk into the Village Beer Merchant than I am to right. walk into Cats, Critters, and, and Fuzzy Things. I don't like better as a uh, description of this. It, uh, better is very uh, subjective, but it could be much okay. more effective. Right. Uh, more is social. that more well? Is it good though? I don't know. Here's a Nick Bilton, and thanks to Tom Baker for this link in our chat room uh, to uh, Nick Bilton in the Bits blog in the New York Times. He tells the story of a guy named David McCandless who took a <laughs> year's worth of data from Facebook with the help of Facebook, scanning 10,000 status updates over a year-long period, and to find out when people break up. And uh, the the biggest times for breaks up breakups two weeks before Christmas and spring break. <laughs> Christmas Day is the low point. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> it is you interesting. Seen, you can't stand Leo. the thought of having to endure the holidays with this person. Yeah. So you, you just take <laughs> care of it beforehand. Yeah. It's like, I don't have to buy gifts. I don't have to deal with your family. Yeah. <laughs> Two weeks before Christmas, you're out. <laughs> you're out. You're out. <laughs> Party, I'm value. going to Cabo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> good thing your wife uh, you doesn't watch the show. Two like, weeks ago. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Uh, a, a scientist, uh, two scientists, uh, you know, found that the mood on Twitter is predictive of the stock oh, market. Yes, I did see that, and very accurate. Right? So. I've, I've I've quoted here before that that uh, uh, Twitter, according to another study, was ninety seven percent accurate in predicting box office success. Yeah. Have you ever seen Jonathan Harris's "We Feel Fine"? No. He's a brilliant artist. I worked with him at Daylife, and uh, he did all kinds of great stuff, like the Whale Hunt. I recommend looking him up. Just Google "We Feel Fine" Jonathan Harris, and he took. Uh, the words uh, uh, feel and feeling, and he has now 14 million data points, and he plots it in incredible ways. And so you can see the time of year when people feel best and worst, wow. and connections and ethnicity and age and just all kinds of stuff. And that, that you know, yeah, you're right, Kevin, it's data mining or it's data nudging or I don't know what it is, <laughs> but that's all there. And it's going to be there. Yeah, I mean, I guess we just have to get used to it. Mark Zuckerberg is just ahead of us. He's already yeah. he's already used he's already kind of seen this and likes the idea. I think the problem is that he doesn't really get why we might not. And maybe he's right. Maybe he's just maybe he's like you, Jeff. He's just saying, you know, you'll get you'll get there.
You you want to live in public. You just haven't gotten well, there. And, and what else happens though, Leo? When we when he does go over, then we beat him up, and he says, "All right, all yeah, right, right, sorry." But you know he's right? thinking. And, and you know he's thinking. Oh, they'll get it eventually. <laughs> but he said he said to me, "Beacon." I said Beacon was was too far ahead, and he said, "No, Beacon was a mistake." Oh, good. That's great. And he knew it, and he knew why the the just the dynamics, the the, the, the motivations didn't work for that. But places. Is Beacon gone smart? Right. Yes. Because now I've That's checked in. Point. I want my burrito. You opted I in. I get the guac, and I am, and I can choose to tell my friends, Jeff just had guac. He's happy. You totally opted into it. Yep. I, I really hope Chipotle comes on as a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Seriously. They've gotten so he many freebies. The, the, the underwear and month club after we plugged him here to come on. Did you, did you, did you uh, see? I tweeted that yesterday, and they had like 800 new uh, subscribers. Oh, oh. Not the power of Leo. I said, oh, my man packs is on the way now with free shave gel. <laughs> Um, you know, but Zuckerberg did a, an interview with Business Insider, which was very good, where he talked about how one of the Facebook's core values is to move fast and break things. Like he, right. and he said that you know he feels like I'm actually this is a good segue into some of the moves into Facebook. Google engineers, one in particular oh, I love, yeah. um, that you know engineers at Facebook have the uh, ability to make a big impact and are encouraged to deploy, push, iterate quickly, and and fail, and fix. And I feel like really that's what we Beacon was. It was right. a mistake, and they fixed it. But move fast and well, break things. I like that. That's the, uh, that's the um, web ethos. And there's two things that Facebook really embodies of the web ethos. One is that uh, push it out and iterate. Uh, which is another way of saying, you know, get it out and break it and then do it again and break it and do it again until you get it right. And the second one is don't worry about making money. And I think this deals thing is very interesting that, they, that they're more interested in building the platform, building the audience and not monetizing it yet. And this is how Facebook's operated all along. And what I really like about deals is that there's an, you can you can uh, set up donations to charity, too. Which yes. I really, yeah. really like that, yes. that. That kind of spoke to me. That also softened me to Zuckerberg a little bit. I was like, okay, this is interesting. So they're creating a use case for donating to charity, for checking in, or for, for yes. participating and interacting. That's, really that's what he does. Want to use it as a platform for that, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just. Uh, what does this do to Groupon? Well, Groupon was there on stage. They obviously welcome this, and they're going to use the Facebook single sign sign on. And they um, demonstrate, I think the, you know, look, this is what's happening. You know, people who would normally be natural enemies like Looped, Face, uh, Foursquare, um, uh, Gowalla, have no choice but to join the party because it's either Facebook's going to push you out or you play in Facebook space. That's what scares me a little bit about this is that this is, they are so powerful now with half a billion users. Uh, they're, they're so almost unstoppable. And so people who would normally say, no, we're going to compete, now say, oh, we can't compete, so we're going to participate, even if we end up getting engulfed and devoured. Which I think a company like Foursquare, what, cha what chance does Foursquare have against places? Uh, none. So, so Facebook, in a way, is saying, you know, we'll let you write to the API. Come on, we'll give you the single sign-on. It'll be good for you. And yeah, it also just means a ton of data flows back to them. You're right. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I love Foursquare. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the voting stuff that, that Foursquare did this week was amazing. Oh, wasn't it? We're going to talk yeah. about that in yeah, a second. Places is not as good as Foursquare. Uh, I don't do think stuff with, still, you think? You can do stuff with places. For instance, this multi, multiple check-in, which at first we thought, that's just creepy where you could check other people into your place. Um, now it makes sense with the deals thing because you can you said bring three friends and get a sandwich. So I, well, I told I told Dennis uh, Crowley when I saw him I said I said this on the show when I said on the show a while ago is I want the prospective Foursquare which that starts to become right right not not where I am or where I was but where I'm going to be and, and and let me use it as an organizing tool and he said yeah 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 you know it's one of a hundred things they got to work on well and here's the beauty frankly of what Facebook's doing Gina you love Foursquare fine keep using it. Yeah, you're right. just, but it's now in the Facebook universe. But I can choose to have pipe into 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 yeah. Facebook, which I do actually do, of course a, you do. a little bit. But this yeah. will be even more intimate because right now you do it as an application, which I do too as an app. I use Foursquare. I don't use Places as an application. But now it's going to update your Facebook location. It's going to add. You know, all of a sudden it'll have more and more Facebook in it. Facebook gets the benefit of seeing all this data across its uh, servers. I have a feeling that. 
It, 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 I, it's, it's not even, it doesn't even have to be malign. It doesn't even have to be like Microsoft did. Come here, let's see what you got. Uh, oh, that's nice, but we're not going to buy you. We're just going to copy you. It doesn't even have to be like that anymore. Oh. Facebook's completely content to have Foursquare be a satellite and continue indefinitely. You want to use Foursquare? Please be our guest, Gina. Well, that's the, other, right. that's the, the other thing you're saying uh, about, about the, the ethos of the web. You know, Google wants you to succeed with your blog. Right. Uh, it's the, the same idea, really isn't platform. it? Yeah. You're, you're right. It's the same idea. But yeah. I'm, so I'm opting into the possibility of seeing Jeff at Chipotle, but what else am I opting into? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where, what else? So I get my friends at the bar, but like, what else happens then later? You know what I mean? In 2013, when you know that I was somewhere in 2010, like, what does that mean? When mm. Facebook has all the that health data. health insurance company it? says your cardiac was caused by all that guacamole, Mr. Jarvis. Well, we right. certainly can think of a lot of bad things. Can we think of some benefits? You have a, you know what's interesting? Remember Gordon, Gordon Bell? Uh, and his book about, uh, you know, he was wearing a camera. I just may still be around his neck, a Microsoft researcher, guy who founded digital equipment. And uh, he was wearing a camera around his neck that take a, took a picture every 10 seconds. And his, he said, eventually, my whole life will be recorded, and you'll be able to search this step. Oh, you don't need a camera anymore. You just need Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I was fascinated by that project. I have a terrible memory. I forget conversations that I have with people. You know, I lost my dad really young, and I think about him a lot, and I try to remember things I talk to him about. And I think, you know, what if I had had a camera, you know, oh, on me the whole time that, that I had oh, him? Or, like, if I yeah. could if I could search all the conversations I've had in my life, like, if I could see recurring themes and sentiments. I mean, this is kind of what I'm doing with ThinkUp. I think there's a lot of important things happen in the conversations that we have. You know, my Gmail archive for the last five years is kind of gold. I search Gmail all the time for some email about this, that, or the other thing. So I think that's really valuable. I just really like having control of that stuff and having it on my hard drive and my computer and, and me collecting it. You know, myware versus spyware, I think Corey Doctorow calls it. It just freaks me out that Facebook has, you know, all that information on their servers. And I guess I could say the same thing about Google. The difference is that I don't just trust Facebook as much as I trust but Google. But you know what? You're Your just... credit card company knows more about That's you true. than anybody. That's, That's true. true. That's absolutely true, Jeff. And at least, at least Facebook, I'm worried about Facebook because they're transparent about what they know. Right. I, I don't think about the credit card company, right? right? It's the people. No, you're you, absolutely right. Yeah, the people who have information that we aren't telling you. Yeah, I mean, EasyPass knows when I go through the toll. I mean, you know, people. <laughs> don't we want, though, ultimately, wouldn't it be awesome to have, to, oh, it's, it's this Mark Zuckerberg saying nobody wants to make lists, but everybody wants the benefit of it. So if you have automated systems that ga gather, correlate, uh, uh, curate all of the information in your life. Isn't that priority inbox? Right? That's yes. the first piece of it. It's a tiny piece We're of it. Watch it's, what yes. we do, and it's coming all kinds of signals, and, and it will be no problem at all to put into priority inbox than other feeds, which is Marissa's, I haven't said this in months, so I'm going to say it again, hyper-personal news stream. Yeah, that's where we had. <laughs> Whatever happened to the hyper person? <laughs> this is the start of it. It's the hyper personal priority life stream. It's everything. Yes. Yes. Let's take and a so break. One of the values we need. I was I was at this thing today with the the postal department trying to rethink what their life is or isn't. Wow. And and as we were going through various you know functions that you need prioritization and filtering, you know, kind of which is the equivalent of aggregating and curating, it becomes very important because of very high value. I I think we're in um, very interesting territory. <laughs> Very interesting territory. Let's take a break. I want to come back with more. We will talk about those transitions. Uh, Google bleeding some very good engineers to Facebook. And maybe you could see a little bit about what's going on. People are saying, isn't this a show about Google? I really should say this week in the cloud. We were going to call it that, but we, we thought it'd be, people would be more compelled if it were Google. But the truth is, it's cloud. And, and what Facebook's doing, what Google's doing, it's all, it's all about uh, what's happening out there. And I think it's all related. It's very interesting. Uh, before we go on, though, I would like to mention our friends at Citrix and GoToMeeting, a great way to use the cloud for your meetings. You know, traveling to a meeting is a pain in the behind, not to mention expensive and stressful. Uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of people say, well, you got to meet face to face to get business done. I think you can do very well with GoToMeeting. A lot of people are, are replacing face to face meetings with conference calls, but that's, you know, boy, it's not visual. It's very can be very dull, and you also kind of feel like you're losing your attendees a lot of times. You can tell they're off answering email or something. This is where GoToMeeting really comes in. You can do it ahead of time. It integrates with your email package. So you just say, send an invitation. It sends out the information with a link and all they need to know to join your meeting. By the way, includes uh, free voice over the Internet and phone teleconferencing. So that's kind of built into GoToMeeting. 
Uh, or you can even, while you're on a conference call with one or any uh, 15 people, you can say, I, I, I got to show you something here. Go to gotomeeting.com. Here's the meeting ID. Now, even if they've never used GoToMeeting before, if they've never installed the software before, 30 seconds later, they're seeing your computer on their screen, PC or Mac. It's completely cross-platform. You can show them the keynote or the PowerPoint. You can show them the websites. It's great for training. It's great for collaboration. Of course, for sales. It really is a breakthrough product because it took, you know, what we, many companies do, which is, you know, kind of remote access and online meetings and made it simple, clean and elegant. So it just gets the job done. I want you to try it free. You don't have to believe me. Just try it free for 30 days. If you go to gotomeeting.com slash twig, uh, before I'm done talking, you'll have it installed. I mean, it's really that quick. You just go to meeting.com slash twig, click, click, click. And then you're in. And now you've got it. And the next time you're on a conference call, just put a post-it note on your screen saying, don't forget to use GoToMeeting. Try it. You'll see your attendees will like it. You'll like it. It's easy to use. At just $49 a month, it's really affordable. I want you to try it. Absolutely free for 30 days. GoToMeeting.com slash tweet. We thank the folks at Citrix for their continued longtime support of the entire network and this week in Google. So, Gina, you said you knew some of these people who've uh, transitioned out from Google? Well, I was talking about Lars Rasmussen, oh, who of course uh, you do. <laughs> actually, he, he wrote the foreword to my book on Wave. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's, he's a web hero. He's somewhat, he's an unsung web hero, but he's certainly one of my heroes. He's the guy with his brother, Jens, who kind of saved us from the crappiness that was MapQuest and, and, and launched Google Maps and, and showed us what JavaScript and Ajax could, do, Ajax could do in a browser. And he was the creator of Wave. And so he announced this week that he is moving to Facebook. Uh, which he announced it me. on Facebook. He announced it on Facebook. Facebook, yeah. yeah. And it was pretty pretty surprising to me. And he said he was pretty frank. I've, I met him at Google I.O. He's a he's an interesting guy. And he said that getting things done at, at Google is really hard. It's a huge organization. Um, and the wave experience was was difficult for him and frustrating. He's a, a really smart guy. And I think he felt like he couldn't see his vision to fruition. In fact, Marissa Meyer said this week uh, on Dig Dialogue, actually, that the that the that wave is one of uh, three mistakes she feels like Google made. Oh. So that was interesting. Wow. Anyway, you know, Zuckerberg. That's, that's to the heart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that mistake in what way? Launching it, how they launched it, what they did with it, or killing it? I mean, what was the mistake? All she said was, we would have done it differently. Uh. <laughs> so... Uh. Uh, but, you know, Zuckerberg courted Lars uh, personally and, and said to him, hey, you know what? We're a small company. You can come in, have huge impact. His job description is like, come into Facebook and hang out and see what happens. It's the equivalent but of Steve Jobs saying to John Scully, you don't want to make sugar water any for the rest of your life, do you? Right. I mean, it really is that kind <laughs> of a much. pitch, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Lars is moving from Sydney to San Francisco to take really? his job. His wife. Yeah, which, which also surprised me because he yeah. based... The wave team out of Sydney to work for, work for Google, so it must be. I, I believe it sounds like it's a very financially compelling offer from Facebook, but also it really made me go like, you know, wow, I, I, I'm su I'm surprised. Is Jen's, uh, is Jen's going too? I don't think so. I think it's just Lars right now. That's I. There was no mention of Jen's. I yeah. wondered about that. His brother. Who it's impressive how he's hiring the best talent. He also got Sam Lesson this week uh, buying Drop.io. That is killing it. Pissed the hell out of me. Yeah. But Sam's yeah. great. I'm I'm happy for Sam's Sam, great. but that pisses me off. And I I can't think of another uh, service that's uh, instant, hundred megs, no. password protected, open. No. I mean, I I tried my best on Lifehacker, but I I still can't even quite find the exact same service. I was uh, really disappointed. I use Drop.io, recommended Drop.io all the time, and I, but I think the world is Sam, and I. I'm happy for him. You know, Zuck said at one point in an interview, and I, 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 this is a, another case of it. He says we don't we don't buy companies for the intellectual property or the assets. We buy it for the engineering. Right, but and he people. he paid off the investors. It's reported. So I mean, getting less than cost him a lot of money. So and getting Lars is an incredible get. And he, you know, you hire someone with that much talent and that much vision, and you entice them with that much freedom. Great things have to happen. Let's yes, let's hope. <laughs> But, but yeah. By the way, I am yeah. going to have my suggestion for a Dropio uh, replacement uh, as my pick of the week. But well, nice. it's not quite the same. But I'll be curious what you think. You probably know about it, Kevin. But I'm going to I'm going to mention. Okay. It. Uh, so and so Sam Lesson is a great acquisition. Lars is a great acquisition. What it really does look like is that Facebook doesn't have an agenda with these. It's not like they're saying, "Oh, we're going to build something like Dropio," or "Oh, we're going to build something like Wave or Maps." They just want the best minds. 
Zuckerberg or um, um, Rasmussen was quoted as saying, um, I don't remember which way it went, but I think either one of them quoted Zuckerberg as saying, like, why don't you come here and hang out for a few years and see right. what happens? Right. Yeah. A yeah. Which is <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's basically saying, you know, we've got this many users, we got our tendrils and all these different aspects of the web, you will have really high impact. We do, you know, and that's the every pitch, individual engineer can get yep, a right. lot done that's here. That's always the, the pitch. pitch. And that's what engineers like. Admittedly, with Facebook pre-IPO and the potential of cash in on millions of dollars, that might sure. have something to do with it. But I have a feeling people like Lars, who I'm sure has enough Google stock to be comfortable. It's not the money that, that, huh. that motivates them. And he even said during the mobile announcement today, he, he made a point of saying that we're a small, you know, the mobile team is a small team. He said several times, and then he got, a, yeah, he got them all. Point of saying he said, that. everybody stand up who was involved in this. And then he said again to the journalists, see, we're a small team. What What is that all about, Kevin? Is that, uh, he sounded like a selling point. It's, you know, uh, maybe he's, uh, maybe he's hunting for more people, but also <laughs> it's just, it's appealing to think that, because you don't think of small groups as being scheming, right? Like you don't think of small ah. groups as being, you know, you 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 know unless they're planning to bomb something i mean they're they're really it's hard to think of a small group of guys hanging out together late night mountain dew you know ruining your life somehow with privacy issues uh, or anything else right, I, I think it's, it's even it's, more than that it's it's exactly against google right exactly yeah. what Laura said yeah. you can't get things done right. at google well look you put a small team, team together look what they built hello and it's his best yeah. competitive if he's going to be built on talent that was his best competitive shot at google interesting I also got the sense he said it with pride, like, see what we've done, and it's just a couple of us. <laughs> yeah, he does that thing where he's like, well, you know, the first iteration of Facebook was built in two weeks. You know, <laughs> just a little bit of the arrogance, like, oh, look at look at how much we've done with just a couple of, you know, we just kicked back a couple of years one weekend, and it just kind of popped out, this beautiful, you know, so <laughs> there's that. He's, you know, he's um, got every right to be proud of that. I think that's He great. does, yeah. he does, he does. He, it was a huge accomplishment. Um but uh, yes, you know, I, I think it was Om, Om Malik wrote this uh, this post, Google's real problem getting things done. And it just talked about, and actually quoted quoted Lars saying that, you know, some some of the, the problem, the reason why Google's losing engineers to Facebook is that it's, you know, it's a slow moving, play, you know, it's, it's hard to get your, your product to bubble up. There's just a huge company and it's hard to get things done and feel like you ha you're having a big impact. And it kind of goes back to like Doug Bowman's post about how, you know, he's, he would have to make his case for three pixels, three pixel or four pixel border, uh, a designer. Right. So kind of a <laughs> similar thing is like, you know, right. I don't have to present data to tell you whether or not I right. think you should have one more pixel, that kind of thing. So maybe yeah, well said, like yeah. down. Yeah. We, we talk, I talked a little bit about this on Mac break because we were talking about Apple, uh, who was acquired in number of companies like Lala or done things like mobile media they've never transformed into viable products Google you can point at a lot of products like dodgeball that just died on the vine at Google wave uh, and I was wondering is this endemic in Silicon Valley that you just throw a lot of stuff on the wall and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't or is it really some sort of flaw in these big teams that they they sometimes can't execute they can't bring a product uh, well, isn't it both, Leo? Isn't it the if you don't give it the support, if you don't see ahead what support it needs? I mean, the, 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 I'm sure Gina will agree with this. The tragedy of Wave was that it it you know it was orphaned very soon. Right, too soon. And it, yeah, exactly. We and it never had the you. chance to really find it what it was. Fourth, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we don't know what it is yet. Wave sure as hell didn't know what it was yet. And you, know, you can't go on with, with huge losses on things. I just see right now this minute, by the way, that Chase Carey, the head of uh, News Corp, says that the losses at uh, MySpace are, are unacceptable and unsustainable. Uh-oh. Feels like the hand's getting near the plug, man. Right? Yeah. Didn't they just do uh, a relaunch and a redesign? Yep. Just, yeah. Just so he's doing well. We're very excited all that. But, but paid content said this. You know, so, so, yeah, there's a limit to this. But if, you know, Buzz didn't have the kind of support to think, you know, A and B and, and Android and Chrome aren't fought together. And, I, you know, I love Google, but, but this, uh, Eric has always said that their biggest challenge is being as big as they are. And it really is true and home to roost. Yep. You always want to think that these big companies could never, um, you know, they're, they're strategic people. They're the, the folks at the top have gotten there by being smart. And then you find out that AOL Time Warner was literally like a tapas dinner that just went on <laughs> too long. making this stuff up as, as they go along. What? I know, really. It was really like a dinner what? they had together. And then the next day they call each other on the phone, like like after a date or something. Like, yeah, yeah. AOL it's, Time it's Warner. Yeah. Exactly right. And that's how Murdoch bought MySpace. Oh, boy. The, the, right. You, you want to assume these companies... Right. 
Yeah. I need to I need to go to Chipotle more often. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poor Kevin. He sounds like he's dying. Are you starving, no, I, Kevin? Is it? <laughs> well, a little bit, but no, I just, I, I feel bad for your business department. <laughs> <laughs> who knows who you might meet? It, it's, <laughs> at some point, a company as big as Google with deep pockets becomes kind of like a startup incubator, but within from within, right? So like the Wave team, from what I understand, was sort of treated like a, a startup that was kind of this yeah, other they part were of the in world, Australia. still doing their own thing. Yeah. They were in Australia, right? And it was like, they had certain goals to meet. You know, Google was going to invest this much, you know, this much staff and money into the development of this product. And if it didn't reach its goals by year one or year two, then they would cut it off. And, you know, if, if the Wave team had been a startup on their own, would, you know, would they would they have made it? I, I don't know. But I part of part of it you know i think is that kind of that that small startups from the within the big company kind of take on things but it does change things you know we've had a million active users because they were a google product but if they were a startup on their own and they had a million active users they would absolutely be considered a success right yeah let's take a break we have lots more to talk about including some very good numbers for the android marketplace a lawsuit google's decided to take on the department of the interior we'll find <laughs> out why and Yes, you may be getting a very big check from Google Buzz. No. <laughs> no. I saw somebody tweet, if I've got this correct, I should be getting $10 million from uh, Google Buzz. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> we'll talk about that in just a second right now, though. I want to talk about our friends at the fine, mighty Ford plant who have created the incredible Ford Sync. Every time I drive my, my Mustang around and I'm listening to my audio books, and then I just then a text message comes in in my Android phone, and I hear it read to me over the sink, or you know I get lost, and I say, "Sink, tell me where I am and how to get to where I'm going." I just think, "Thank my lucky stars, fun somebody finally got this thing right." I have driven plenty of cars that you try to talk to, none of them feels like Kit and Knight Rider. My Mustang does. It's amazing. It understands everything I'm saying. Ford Sync is true hands-free calling. You press a button on your steering wheel, you say phone, you say uh, call Gina Trapani at work, and boom, it just does it. It's amazing. It's also turn-by-turn -turn directions. Even if you don't buy the full GPS package, all Ford Sync vehicles have GPS in them and can, and can tell you turn-by-turn -turn without a big display, but they tell you to turn how to go. They even know what your route is, and they'll warn you about traffic problems ahead. They'll even reroute you if you need it. They also have 911 assist, and now this is optional, but I, uh, you know, you can turn it off or on, it, but I always turn it on on all my phones because when I get in the car, it automatically pairs up. And now if something bad happens and my airbags get deployed, the Ford Sync calls 911, gives it my GPS coordinates because it knows exactly where I am, plays a recorded message and turns on my phone, a microphone, and says, you got anything you want to tell them? <laughs> I'm Okay. <laughs> Ford Sync is fantastic. It's available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury uh, vehicles. Uh, if you haven't tried it, there's a couple of things you could do. You could go to the website, SyncMyRidePodcast.com. Some great videos and demos there. But really, there's nothing like trying it in person and seeing how smart it is about recognizing your voice, all the things it could do. You know, you could press the button and say, it goes dong, and you say, climb it. Set temperature 74 degrees, and it does it. I mean, it's just, it's kind of spooky. It's like your car understands you. Ford Sync. Go get, go, go get it today at your local Ford, Lincoln, or Mercury vehicle. And believe me, if you're test driving cars, you're in the market for a car, try all the other guys. Do, do try, you know, we have some other manufacturers cars, and I just, you know, you'll see immediately how much better the sync is. SyncMyRidePodcast.com. We thank them for their support. Android phones this past quarter, 44% of all smartphones sold in the U.S. The headlines in most newspapers were Apple beats RIM. With 26%, not many papers said, and oh, by the way, yeah, the iPhone was 26%, Android was 44%. <laughs> Although I have to say, in Apple's defense, Apple's iPhone was the number one selling handset. So if you take any one Android handset and compare it to the iPhone, iPhone wins. But it's just because there's 20 plus Android headsets, handsets that 44% uh, is amazing. It is. And more um, devices coming. And Say again? More devices coming. What do we think about this uh, uh, Nexus 2? Is that real? Yeah, I think it is. Samsung has a big uh, event. When is that event, Eileen? November 8th. November 8th. So uh, a couple of days, five days. Mm -hmm. I suspect... It, it doesn't... See, I don't think the Nexus 2 is going to be... Uh, I mean, just from what I've read, it, it sounds like it's just kind of the next... 
developers slash early adopter handset and that they're I mean, they're obviously not going to be doing the same kind of uh, carrier independent launch like they did with the Nexus yeah, One. I mean, it's it's not. I mean, Nexus One was HTC. It was sold by Google. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sell the Nexus Two? Google. Yeah, Gizmodo had someone who uh, I, I kind of sources like a friend of theirs got a hold of it and and gave them their report and uh, said it was basically like a Galaxy S with some nice features, That's a front facing like. camera. Yeah. Um, you know, a, few, a little more styling maybe, but. Um, it seems like it's really just going to be kind of the phone for people like me, people like developers who want to have the stock Android right away. And, um, you know, but still, it's kind of neat that they're at the point now where there are so many good phone, so many good Android phones out there that they don't need to come out with a Nexus one and say like this, this is your paradigm. <laughs> Like, you know, it's, uh, at it's the same nice. time, I, I want that, like, you know, pure Google phone. Like, I, I love too. my Nexus One because, yeah. because oh, I yeah. have that. So I like yeah. that. I, I don't like the uh, add ons. I really don't. And it's nice to have the pure experience, at least to experience it. Now, the most interesting product rumor uh, came from Digitimes, the uh, Taiwanese electronics uh, uh, paper that said Google Chrome devices, not Android devices, but Chrome operating system devices may be out later this year. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You like that? You're looking for that? I want that as much as I want a burrito. I have to say, I am after, you know, and I'm supposedly going to get a review unit of the Galaxy S tab. Ooh. Um, and yeah, when I do, we'll about talk that. about it. But but um, my, I'm gathering that because, you know, Google itself says don't use 2.2, don't use Froyo on a tablet. The apps are not optimized for the screen size. I'm having a feeling that that's not going to be an ideal experience. Ooh. But yeah, I, we'll so see. Yeah. And the Speaking seven of inches. ideal experiences, go ahead, Jen. No, I was going to say, and the you know the seven the seven inch, the small right smallness of it, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas a Chrome device, maybe that's what we want. It'll be built around an ARM processor, manufactured by Inventec. This is all from Digitize, launching this month. And Digitize says Google also plans to launch its own brand Google Chrome Netbook. They did say, didn't didn't they say, didn't Eric say we're going to do one? I think he did. So, Leo, I have to ask you. You said that the that the new MacBook Air made you use your iPad less, yeah. right? Yeah. This is okay. Sweet. So now, do you feel the same way about? So to that, I thought, well, yeah. I mean, I use my netbook more too because it's got a keyboard. It's a real keyboard, right. and you can create and do things. So, do you feel similarly about a Chrome OS based netbook? Well, like I think for me now, and this is very personal, so everybody's going to have a different opinion. I think for me, the the key to the uh, iPad was form the weight, you know, size, weight, and battery life. And this is very close in size and weight. Battery life is five, not 10 hours, but I'm talking about the MacBook Air, but but it's good enough um, that I find I use this more. And and for the things that I do, like blogging, uh, bookmarking stories, you know, Google Reader, it's, it's I think, a better, frankly, better uh, tool, mm -hmm. as, for especially if you're doing any content creation, even light-duty content creation. I think that the, the iPad is not really I ideal for that. It's you're great just saying all this to make me feel good. Did you buy an Air or no, you sent back the iPad? I was up at the iPad, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've held out too. You know, I mean, Jobs himself kind of admitted that the touch interface isn't ideal, you know, down, you know, up, you know, just vertically right. versus horizontally. And that's why yeah, you, know, you they, don't want to reach touchpad. out and do touch. Right. Right, but but the iPad is unless it's in your lap and your knees are up. Anyway, this is this is a conversation everyone's had a million times already. But I was curious to know. I, I kind of lost interest in the Chrome OS a little bit because I said, you know, I just really want a, a good Android tablet, and I'm good. You know, I've got a netbook, I'm fine. But you know, my netbook's a little slow. I would, I, I might be interested in, in checking out this Chrome is, OS. I mean, it's an expensive netbook. This the I, the MacBook Air, and yeah. I, I think Chrome OS, Chromium OS, Chrome OS would. Be interesting. Now, the the thing that this digitized implies is that Google's going to do this kind of Nexus One strategy only with a, a a netbook or a Chromium notebook. I'll buy one. Yeah, I hope they have some good hardware engineers working on it. Some I really they, smart designers. Yes, you're right. You're right. But 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 they have the specs out for it already, don't they, Kevin? You uh, know for the, the tablet or for be. the <laughs> Digitime says instant on, <laughs> long lasting battery. <laughs> also, HP and Acer will have uh, units based on Chrome OS by December. Okay, but going to Kevin's point about about uh, kind of better be good hardware, but be other good things. Google TV, did you install it? Oh, I can give you my review. Hardware's <laughs> good. Nothing's wrong with the hardware. So um, didn't make it right. It's a little weird to have a uh, your remote control be a keyboard, but <laughs> it, it, on the bright side, it's it's pretty usable. Uh, I think it's way over complicated. It doesn't give you enough value, really, to 
to uh, justify either the cost or the complexity. I mean, you know, it did an update before you can install it. It's a half hour update. And then I just did last night. It's, uh, I'm watching TV. It's a good thing it wasn't the World Series. I'm watching TV and it says, pops up a big thing on my screen saying, I'd like to update myself now, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> now, you could, in its defense, you could say, no, do it later. But it's like annoying. It's like no one if wants that to happened in Glee... Yeah. Oh, my God, I would have been infuriated. Get out of my way. Where's the keyboard, Maud? <laughs> Interrupting my queen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it has problems with HD. It has problems with Dolby Audio. Uh, you know, I, it, for me, I haven't had those problems, although occasionally I get a weird HD effect where it feels like it's delayed or the frame rate is low. Um, it And there's not a lot of functionality. The Netflix that's in there is not the current version of Netflix, but the previous version. So both Roku and Apple TV have a much more advanced Netflix version in which you can subscribe to movies within it. You can't do that on the uh, on the Logitech review. Uh, the apps that are there are very scant, and there's no marketplace yet. Now, if you add the Android market and down the road I start seeing a lot of apps for this thing, I'm going to change my tune, perhaps. But right now, uh, there's nothing compelling about it. It can't do really much of as much as, say, the uh, $99 Roku box, and it's a lot more complicated to set up and use. Wait, wait, wait. Hold like on the wait for Rev2. For wait for Rev2. Wait for the market, Android market. You know, th th this is early days, absolutely. Don't don't buy the G1 of TVs. It is the G. Very good. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one, Kevin. Very good. That's exactly True. what it is. And I, have this, I had the same high hopes that I had for the G1 and the same disappointment when I started using it. That's a very yeah. apt analogy. You're, you're on fire today, Kevin. <laughs> you're on fire, I try. And, there, you know, it's interesting because there's some real... Go Google's starting to get advocates in the same way that Apple has advocates. There's some real Google advocates who kind of were mad at me that I didn't like Google TV. And I said, well, I just have to say, I just this is my Nobody experience. Nobody did. Uh, the reviews were awful. How's the search interface? That's the that's like the saving grace I've, I've pretty much, you know, uh, grabbed from all the reviews well, I've the read. Point, is that right? the point, but right. I don't want to. I don't really. <laughs> I don't want to search for shows that often. <laughs> I kind of oh. know where where the stuff I want to see is. Don't you? That's not a good sign. <laughs> uh, now, well, is I mean, because like, there's an Android app, and, it, and the Android now has a remote control that it works with my TV. It's a little weird, but it does work. I was explaining to a friend, and he said that it would it would be the weirdest. It would be the greatest interface for your weird friends. Who are like, I wonder if there's anything with Willem Dafoe on at exactly. four p.m. Sunday. Like, yeah. and that. So there you go, but. Who does that? Exactly. Um, I just think it's not quite ready. And, and things like, you know, if somebody, somebody, I saw a picture on Twitter. Oh, this is really cool. Live TV and Twitter just as it's supposed to be. Except that the live TV is this little tiny picture in picture. And the Twitter is the whole screen. You cannot resize the TV and, and downsize the Twitter. The Twitter is um, the whole thing. It's little things yeah. like that. Leo, I, I have difficulty in that. I think everybody, there, there's this holy grail of getting everything on the TV I can't imagine. Maybe I'm just because I'm 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 getting old. I can't imagine many apps that would really be great for a TV. Well, Pandora's there, uh, which is not TV app, but I mean at least you can listen to your music. Um, Hulu would have been nice had Hulu allowed it. ABC, still NBC, TV, yeah. right? Um, I'd like a little angry, angry Okay, I'll tell you one. Angry Birds. If okay. I could get a right. full <laughs> screen, sixty-inch Angry Birds, so gaming could be really awesome on this thing. Okay, that's it. Yep, you won. Yeah, angry boards. I would like a ticker tape of either all the tweets that mention Glee or there just my go. friends' tweets that mention Glee, just kind of streaming along yes. the bottom while I watch Glee. Like that, not enough to get in the way of the show, but enough for me to laugh at a joke that somebody cracked. That's very good. And they, or during and, a, the World Series game. And that's example. an easy thing to implement. But they mm -hmm. haven't implemented it yet. That, that, but that would be, that's exactly what I would like. I don't want to see the big Twitter and the little TV. I want the big TV, a little crawl of Twitter. That'd be awesome. Yep. That maybe I could click and reply. Mm -hmm. A little bit like I want a I want a Facebook Places stream so I can feel bad about how active all my friends are <laughs> while I'm sitting at home like, watching like my TV. My friends are outside and I'm at home <laughs> <laughs> watching The Wire again. <laughs> you know right. what? The Wire. You know perfectly well all your friends are also watching The Wire, so it'd be kind of fun. You could all you could all say we're you know couch potatoes together. <laughs> Indeed. We can uh, all check in at the wire. The, the potential's there. I think that's really apt. It's the G1, and I'm willing to I'm willing to stipulate that you know the next generation uh, might be well worth getting. But don't but save your money on the 299 Logitech review. That's a lot okay. of money for something that's not very. Get a 99 dollar Roku box. The Roku box is great. It's fantastic. Yeah, and it works, and we're on it. Actually, we're on this too. You can get it, but you know you browse through the podcasts and all that stuff. You can get that. Uh, 
Google's lobbyists, apparently. Now, this comes from Breitbart, so take it with a grain of salt. I don't usually quote Andrew Breitbart, uh, but he, uh, I mean, I think the facts are there. It's his interpretation that I might disagree with. Uh, yesterday, of course, uh, or a couple of days ago, the FTC decided to close its investigation into the Google Wi-Fi incident. Uh, Breitbart writer Ken Bain points out that this came one week after Obama attended a $30,000 a plate fundraiser at Marissa Meyer's house. Uh, also, uh, Becky Burr, uh, a Google lobbyist at Wilmer Hale, on September 28th, emailed White House officials asking for a meeting asking the White House to assist in getting the FTC to back off the investigation. Um, so White House, I mean, that's what you hire lobbyists to do, right? Yeah. And I think the reason that I don't, I mean, I think the facts are probably fine. Um, I think we all agree that the Wi-Fi thing really is, is bogus. And so the FTC should have dropped it. So I can't get I, I all would, head up preserve. about the lobbying on it. Yesterday, Google Street View went up in Germany, the first bits of it. And I went berserk because it was just, I, I wrote a piece that got translated into German on this, asking, you know, Germany, what have you done? <laughs> if you look at the uh, pages, it's like, it's, it's like pixel bombs. They bombed their buildings digitally. It's so stupid. It's offensive. It really is. And it's, it's a diminishment of what's public. I'm not going to go off on all my Jarvis rants right now, but, but it's just ridiculous. And the, and the Germans are getting all mad at me. And well, it's like, not like, all like, the Germans. Campbell. We had a guy on net at night yesterday who was a, 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 an artist, a really interesting artist, does uh, installations. And his uh, artistic collective, FAT, in Berlin built a fake Google Street View car. To drive people crazy, <laughs> it's just got a cardboard thing, and they throw around, you know, looking, looking <laughs> because they thought it was so stupid that yeah. that Germans were so worried about this. The, the hashtag for this is is now called Blurmany. Blurmany, what? Oh, blur! And you blur the uh, blur in Germany. Somebody, somebody uh, put up a blurred German flag, and you know, so there is like Blurmany. <laughs> uh, let's see, Google Buzz settlement. We're rich. <laughs> Not. Uh, not. Uh, so the settlement uh, got preliminary approval, class action lawsuit by Gmail users over privacy violations when Buzz launched. We all remember that. The settlement calls for Google to pay $8.5 million, but not to you, not to me, but toward a fund for organizations focusing on Internet privacy policy or education. Google said, we're satisfied with the argument, glad to move forward. Preliminary approval. And you can opt and out of the settlement if you're a Gmail user, right? But then... Then you get nothing. Then you have to file S another lawsuit, win that in order yourself. to get anything other. Right. Yeah. Privately. How, how weird right. was it to get your second email ever from Gmail? The first one was like, Gmail's different. Here's how when you sign up. And now this is the second time. I, I really can't think of another time they've emailed <laughs> every Gmail user uh, and said, hey, by the way. <laughs> you get nothing. Did you assume right off the bat that it was spam? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. What are they mailing me for? Hey, one more uh, YouTube, uh, one more uh, Google transition. YouTube uh, CEO and founder uh, is stepping down uh, from Google. I don't know if he's uh, taking a new job or uh, or what. Chad Hurley. Chad Hurley. Yep. Transitioning away from the chief executive role for the last two years, ceding most day to day business decisions to Google VP of Product Management Salar Kamangar. Um. I don't know where Steve Chen is. He's He left as CTO. He, went, he left a while ago. Yeah. No, no, to Google. He went to my mothership Google. Okay. But he's, yeah, he's still working at Google. Uh, yeah, I think Chad stayed on in an, for him to have stayed on as CEO of an acquired company for that long is actually pretty amazing. Maybe he just didn't vest right away. Uh, so, maybe. So uh, Kala Mangar is now, Google employee number nine, by the way, is now running YouTube. Um, YouTube actually uh, streamed, was it CBS coverage was streaming on YouTube during the election. Let's talk a little bit about the election and then we'll uh, wrap it up with our, because uh, we got to get going here with our um, picks. Um, Foursquare, I loved that. Didn't you love that, Gina? I checked in and I got an I voted badge. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. I love the map where you could see how many other people checked in and, and, and you could you could play in real time watching people check in. I mean, it was, it, it was really this kind of sense of community, like we're all going out and doing this thing. I mean, you heard a lot about voting on Twitter for sure if you were keeping up with that, but it was definitely this sense of like group civic do you, action. Do you think more really young people voted because of that? 
I definitely think it added a little, hey, I know people who are insane about getting four square badges, and they were like, I will check in at a polling place. <laughs> I got that. I got <laughs> yes. the Halloween badge and the voting badge. Yeah, me too. And it was a good week for badges. No, it's true. Hey, we all get those I voted stickers on our shirts. It's, it's the, it's you the know, same, same thing, but better. stays with you. Yeah, exactly. There was a little Instagram meme where people took a, a picture of their chest with their I voted uh, sticker, which I thought was kind of a neat meme. Excellent. Actually, Facebook did an amazing thing. If you logged on to Facebook on Election Day, not only would you see a link that said, where's your polling place, but you could check in that you voted and all your friends would see the badge you voted. And they kept counting and that at last time I checked, it was 12 million people on Facebook voted. That's, That's fantastic. Power. That's, That's a using lot power, of power for good. Yeah. I mean, uh, now yeah. think about that. I mean, I think that's got to have some get out the vote impact. It has to. Yeah. Uh, YouTube, uh, they keep testing YouTube live streaming. I keep waiting. I'd love to use it, guys, if you hint, hint. But CBS did live streaming of their coverage on YouTube. All the networks, of course, streamed on their own websites. Um, NBC was supposed to use Twitter, and I didn't see it on Twitter, but supposedly they were going to stream on Twitter. Despite all this, of course, uh, 60% of eligible voters did not vote in the midterm elections yesterday, which is shameful. But uh, maybe we can get them next time. All right, we're going to uh, take a break, come back with your tip of the week, Gina, your number of the week, Jeff, if we haven't stepped on it, stomped on it. No, you did one, but I got another one. G Gina, for a rare moment, killed mine, but I got another one. Huh. I, got another oh. one. I got a tip of the week. I was going to do Blecko. Which I really like, but Business Week says it's doomed, so I guess not. <laughs> have, anybody, I, I, have you used Blecko? I, I, I messed around with it to review it for Lifehacker. Um, seems like a neat idea, but um, anytime you have to train people on how to search, yeah, I don't know how, how much uh, reach and uh, ad adoption it's going to see. Oh, well. <laughs> I, set we'll up, I set up a couple of uh, slash tags. That's the idea is that... It, is, are they Google search results? Where do the search results come from? I don't think they're their own search results. Are they? I think they, they I seem like their own independent database of, really? uh, but it was very, it was a very specifically narrow database of like 3 million ish sites or something or 3 million ish, uh, you know, trusted, verified, well-linked sites or, uh, you know, networks, it seemed like. So the idea, yeah, see so the idea is you would uh, set up a slash tag. I have two. One is a slash tag slash twit, which constrains the search to official pages from twits, you know, people like, yeah. you know, Gina and Jeff. And then another one, which was taking my OPML with all the tech news sources and using that. So if you do a search on Blecko for Google with my slash tag tech news, actually, you probably do slash Laporte slash tech news, um, then it would constrain the search to just the sources that I had already set up ahead of time, which I think is pretty useful. But you're absolutely right. It's it's way too complicated. Nobody's ever going to use it. So. Also, ideally, that way you could search for U2 slash plane. So you could look up things about the spy plane as opposed to U2 slash band. But can't you and already you, do that on uh, on Google? Yeah. You, on it's, Google, you just have to do, just you know, U2 dash band, you know, dash to show all the things you don't want included. Right. Or jeez, uh, Gina's going to school me on this. I, uh, I was no, researching not. my tip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Never mind. I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It is probably it is a it is a, a far reach to get people to to train people in in a new way to search. So good luck. Yes. And uh, Jeff, I didn't mention your blog post on why I was rooting for Cablevision. Um, Cablevision finally caved and gave Fox the extra money they wanted in the uh, in the fight. And by the way, as soon as Cablevision gave. Uh, apparently, Dish also caved, and uh, oh. Fox is now back on both. But those companies are paying the higher subscriber fees that Fox demanded. Which is the first problem is what's going to go to us, uh, you know, yeah, users of, sure. of this. Second problem, it is already, notice Glee, by the way, there. Uh, uh, You're just pandering already, to us now, Jeff. You're just pandering to me and Gina. <laughs> Love it. She's cute. She's cute with the big You eyes. don't even watch uh, the show, yeah. do you? Do you watch the show? <laughs> I do now. Oh, okay. my, my wife can't stand it. Really? Um, yeah, first <laughs> prostate loss, now this. You know. I, I, oh, you're turning into a girl. I, oh, I yeah. just, oh, yeah. I just, I thought you of all people would be like, you know, just hate glee, just hate it with a passion. You know, it's your wife. I'm gonna admit something right now. What? I like show tunes. I do too. Nice. I do too. Any any time people burst into song, I don't care how crappy the show is. If people burst into song every ten minutes, I'm happy. Bro, 
Oh, a little gay. <laughs> <laughs> if I could figure out how to do numbers on Twit, I would be. <laughs> We'd be bursting into song every 10 minutes. Put right it on a hat. Finishing the hat. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we're Sondheim. <laughs> Son it's even worse. Yeah. And what it does is, yes, I like Sondheim. I, do too. I love Sondheim. I do too. Hey, let's take what a break. We're going to come back. And I think we have a bonus tip from, uh, from uh, our guest, Kevin Purdy, as well. Indeed. Coming up in just a little bit. But first, I do want to, I have a tip for you. Here's a great tip. You got some old gadgets lying around? Of course you do. If you, if you are a Twit viewer or listener, you for sure have crap lying around. That's just part of the game, isn't it? Old phones, old laptops, old remote controls. Well, look, at this is the time to get rid of it, make a little money on the side, and, uh, and maybe spend it on the next gadget, the next big thing. And that's with Gazelle. Don't sell it. Gazelle it. It's the best way to recycle your used gadgets and get full dollar for them. Just go to gazelle.com. I wonder if I could put in the Logitech review. Let's just see. <laughs> no, no, Too no. soon. Too soon. Wait a minute. I did. I saw Maybe it. Maybe not. I saw it. Oh, my God. I can already sell the Logitech review. So, uh, no, it's not there. But the squeeze box is the pocket digital, the click smart. Let's say you have a Harmony. Maybe you have an old Harmony remote. That would be a good example. You know, you upgrade it to something better. Uh, you enter it in. They've got uh, all these different categories. Oh, look, you can even do old DVDs. I didn't know that. Wow, this is cool. Or iPods. What happens is, I'll do something uh, more more common. Let's do an iPod. Oops. Somehow I got tripods. My, my spelling's not so good. I-P-O-D. It will look up the various iPod models. You can enter it in. Let's say we have a fourth generation Nano and we're ready to upgrade to the iPod Touch. Eight gigabytes. You press the uh, search button. It then uh, will ask you, well, does it power on? Yes. Is it engraved? No. Rate the overall condition? It's pretty good. I have all the discs and the cables and the battery. Let's calculate the price. 33 bucks. Now, you can even see a graph of the chart of the price. Then you add it to a box. You click Add to a box. They're going to send you a box. Postage paid. You fill it up. Actually, I'm going to provide my own box. They'll, send, they'll pay for the shipping. You fill it up. Put as many gadgets as you want in there. Send it back to them. Their experts will strip your data out of it, so you don't have to worry about that. Verify uh, your, the condition as uh, stated, and then send you a check. Or, if you wish, you can donate that to charity. Gazelle has a great find, uh, Fund a Cause page where you can do a kind of gadget drive instead of a cake sale for your favorite charity. And if it's not worth anything at all, but you just want to recycle it, Gazelle does great Earth-friendly recycling, too. Nothing, nothing goes into the uh, landfill. It's all EPA-certified recyclers, green recyclers, so you know that it's getting a good home. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E. -E. Now, after you go there and you add up all your devices and you get a check, and, or price, rather, uh, add the offer code TWIG, you'll get an additional 5% bonus on your Gazelle box. What could be better than that? Don't sell it. Gazelle, a great way to recycle your used gadgets. G A Z E L L E dot com. We love Gazelle. We use it all the time, actually, because we we're the we're the kind of the central for gadget central for old stuff. <laughs> Someday that Logitech review will be there. Gina Trapani, your tip of the week. My tip this week is a kind of interesting new take on um, the mobile keyboard. It's called 8-Pen, um, and I'm not quite sold on it yet. You, you have to spend some time with it to learn how to type with it, but it's an Android app. It's in the Android market now. I think it's like a uh, buck 99 or maybe maybe a uh, pound 99. Um, but it, it, it lets you type by dragging your finger uh, across a grid in kind of an 8 a figure eight um, motion gesture. And there's actually a YouTube video, and I'm, I'm searching for it now, uh, that you can see kind of, oh, it's the8pen.com. You can uh, you can watch a, a demonstration of how it works. So if you don't like pecking away at your regular Android keyboard, if swipe didn't do it for you, 8pen might be it. The problem with 8pen, though, is that it's like the learning curve is pretty steep. Uh, I only spent a few minutes with it, and it definitely took me some time to get used to it. But I've heard from people who took, stuck it out and learned the new way to, to, to type that it was said that it was super, super fast. Um, so skip ahead in this video. It, it, it does a kind of thing. It says typing on your mobile phone is really slow. Blah, 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 blah. blah, 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 blah. 
blah. You want to get to the point. It looks like an X. Yeah. Oh. So this is so this is how it works. You, you start your finger starts in the middle and then kind of flows around and chooses letters. Oh, that's weird. Um, it's really weird, but also really kind of kind of interesting. Um, th so the letters are going to show up soon. They're going to fill it in. So you uh, like this better than swipe, or is just an it, alternative? I it's just an alternative. I'm not sold on it yet. I just started playing with it today before the show, and uh, it was weird. I could see the p potential. It's got this deep learning curve, and this one. Well, that's one what I'd worry about. I don't know how to type with this. I mean, I yeah, that's that's the thing. And actually, on that demo, the letters should fill in. If you skip ahead, All you'll right. see where the letters the letters will show up. Um, so it's oh, kind I of we, yeah. So keep going, keep going. The letters still aren't. Up. Oh, there they are. You can you can see them. So that's just weird. I, so it just it would take some time to get used to it, but once you get a sense of where the letters are, and they've actually designed <laughs> the keyboard so that the the letters that we most use in the English language are closer to the middle, right. um, the the letters that we use least are on the outer outer edges, uh, so it's easier to type. Oh, good. Then they then they scramble them up so they're in different order. <laughs> I guess you get your choice. This is the equivalent of the Dvorak keyboard for. So yeah, so this, this is kind of like for the brave folks who really kind of want a whole new way to type in your mobile phone. I mean, the premise is good is that typing on your mobile phone is just painful do you have to go to the center after each letter yeah you start and you start at the center and you end at the center okay so you're just kind of going you just kind center, of you're you, going, center. going okay. oops okay yeah. oh, that's weird yeah. so it's, it's weird but it's also uh, how long have you been using it and, and have you learned it I, li I literally just started playing with it today. I spent about, I, I worked through the tutorial. I spent about 10 minutes today and I started to get it toward the end, but then I then I had to get ready for the show. But right. I think if you spend like a good 20 minutes with it, which is a lot to ask, I know, for kind of the initial user experience, uh, you, you can start typing really fast. And people, people who have spent the time say that they absolutely love it. Well, if you think about it, uh, why should the QWERTY keyboard make any sense on a touch screen? It's oh. completely it sensible that oh. we would want to reinvent it. Except that there, there's all this built-up muscle memory and stuff that we've got to. Right. So I'm willing. I'll try it. I'll you can you can program uh, gestures too. What like did you search it? for? Eight pen. The number eight, eight pen. P E N. How much is it? Uh, I think it's a uh, pound ninety nine in, in the Android 99. market. You can also, if there are certain things you type a lot, you can create a gesture. So you can say like sideways oh. eight is going to be like talk to you later, Leo, or something like that. Oh, so I you like can that. program in uh, things that you say often, like your email address right. or something that's annoying to type. Interesting. All right, H Pen, the number eight P E N. It's on the Android market. Jeff, also, I had I, I, one more thing. I'm sorry. I had some some geeks on Twitter saying that you have to mention this for nerds who run their own web server. Uh, Google released Mod Page Speed, which is an Apache module which can speed up your web pages by fifty percent. <laughs> Check it out if you run your own web server. It's better than uh, some of the other caching solutions. Um, I think it's on top of other. Oh, other I see. Solutions. Yeah, yeah. It's a huh. so it's a Apache module. Um, and there's a there's a demo of an AdSense site running it and not running it, and it's almost almost a 50% increase. Wow. Yeah. Nice. nice. Well, Google's all about the fast web, as we know. Yep. Yes. Jeff Jarvis, your number of the week. So now that Gina stole my three things Google made a mistake with. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Jeff. It's too small a number. You can't do it. All right. It's all right, Gina. I was going to raise it and, and, and sacrifice it anyway because it was, it was relevant. Uh, so Facebook said that um, the, the sheer number of fans alone, imagine the extra data they have, but that alone predicted more than 70% of key races yesterday. Wow. Uh, more fans equals 74% winning percentage in key house races. You know, I saw well, Randy Zuckerberg on CNN say that the top three friended people were GOP candidates. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that interesting? It, it is. I mean, 80% of Senate wins foreshadowed on Facebook, says their press release. House Democrats incumbents lost on Facebook before losing on Election Day. That's to say that uh, ah. 46 House Democratic incumbents lost their seats yesterday. More than 78% of them had fewer Facebook fans than their challengers, which I think in part was because they were the old farts. Right. Uh, so it's just it's just really fascinating. And again, that's just, that's a very sim simple, quick layer of the data that's there in Friends. But you know, if you really start to analyze the discussion about these candidates beforehand on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, back to the kind of we, we feel fine thing, imagine what's there to predict races in more reliable ways. This is like Larry saying, "We know what you want before you know." Kind of. Uh, Eric said, "We know where you are. We know what you want." That's Eric. Okay. Very interesting. Kevin, you've got a little tip for us. I do. Um, I recently was in Florida and I got off the plane and I swear I didn't plan this, but I got off the plane and um, my wife and I were starving and I Google Maps searched for Chipotle. No. And I did. I'm sorry. And so um, 
I, I looked for it, and I was with my Nexus One, and I was, and I was like, come on, fi- <laughs> come on, welcome, Marge, welcome to Twib this week in Burritos. <laughs> And um, I kept looking for it, and it, it didn't know where I was. It, it just, the GPS was all messed up. And I, I kept trying to say, I'm not in Buffalo. Come right. on, can't you tell from the right. weather? And <laughs> it wouldn't respond. And so um, I, I, I moaned about it on my complete Android uh, Twitter feed, like I tend to do. And um, one reader gave me a really good recommendation for an app called GPS Status and Toolbox. Oh. Um, and you just search for GPS status. That'll usually bring it up in the uh, market. And it's it's a it's a data geek stream because you can um, use the share button and literally just send your GPS coordinates to people. Um, very specific, you know, very specific type of stuff. And you can see, you know, all kinds of crazy. Um, if you were to geocaching, this would be a great app. Uh, but the main thing that I, I liked it for is that you can use it to reset your GPS data um, in your phone. And I, I guess sometimes I, I'm not an expert on how it works, but you know, your GPS location, your, your pings get stored inside the phone uh, kind of locally. And you can set this to just wipe out your GPS and get it restarted without having to actually That's restart you your phone. Yeah, you need to get rid of the almanac, right. almanac files so it will reload there you those. Go. Yeah. And, and a, a reader tell, or a, a, a Twitter follower tells me that you can also use it to automatically wipe out your GPS every so often, oh, which gives idea. you a slightly shorter reacquisition, uh, longer reacquisition time, but still it would have been just the a, first time, just the first time. And right. it would have been a much nicer um, thing for me to have when I was in Florida trying to get to an aforementioned Mexican themed fast food restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time I travel, that happens to me because you have to create new almanac pages, which tell it where the satellites are and all that stuff before you can get a good, uh, a good fix. Yeah. yeah. Good tip. So what GP- was the name of that? G- GPS status and toolbox. The GPS status should just bring it up. Excellent. Uh, I have a couple of, uh, actually, three tips for you. Of course, there is a new Facebook app, 1.4, so go to your Android Marketplace and get it. It has a lot of nice features if you're a Facebook user. Also, Twitter has updated its app to give it the same, basically the same look and feel as the iPhone version of Twitter, which was basically Tweety. Uh, So if you are an old Tweety user, you'll be very happy about the new Twitter Android app, which is a little bit more powerful. And I don't know if they got rid of the clouds. I hope they did, the moving stuff. You You never like those clouds. never like those clouds. But uh, But Kevin was mentioning, as we mentioned, that Dropio is going away. Sam Lesson is hired by uh, Facebook. And Facebook, unlike FriendFeed, which they kind of continue to run, they said, you know, we're not creating any more free Dropio accounts. If you've got a paid account, you better get out by December. That's it. It's over. And December 15th. Yeah, I was looking for a replacement, too. Now, this isn't exactly a one-for-one feature replacement, uh, but it's very intriguing. And, in fact, I, I found out about it because they tweeted. They said, hey, folks who are looking for a Dropio replacement, you should uh, think a little bit about Tonido. Are you aware of this one, uh, Kevin? Seen it. Uh, I didn't. I guess I didn't dig into so it enough. So there's two parts to this. There's a hardware part and a software part. You don't have to have the hardware. I have ordered the hardware, which is basically Pogo Plug Plus. It includes BitTorrent and other features. But there's a software version that basically gives you a right-click share this file and effectively creates on your own hard drive a file share, much like a Dropio would be, that's private and secure. Uh, You send this special unique link to uh, the person you want to share the file with. I guess you have to leave your machine on, but uh, otherwise um, it kind of does the work for you. you This might even be easier than Dropio since you don't have to upload anything. Oh. Isn't that Can you intriguing? password protect? Uh, I don't know. I have to play with it. You do have a, a you know, it's, it's, it's secure by obscurity because it's an odd URL. Ah, um, yes. Although you can create a public share as well with your username dot tonidoid dot com. Um, so it's very interesting. And then if you add the hardware to it, you really have your own cloud storage, um, you know, uh, with your own hard drives and so forth. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's not exactly Dropio, but it is fully software-based, and it has some interesting features. In some ways, might make it better than Dropio. There's no storage limit at all, for instance. Um, so well, well worth uh, looking at. I signed up for it, and I've ordered the hardware, and I'll give you a review of the hardware uh, when it arrives. I'm a big Pogo Plug fan. I love Pogo Plug. Uh, but, but there's a free software service as well, and that, that might be something that Dropio... Refugees might want to look into. 
All right, that's it. We're out of time. Boy, are we out of time. Thank you, everybody. Jeff's got to go catch a train. Thank you, Jeff Jarvis. Choo-choo. Author of What Would There's Google Do? There's a totally on the way there, by the way. You just didn't watch it. I'm getting my burrito bowl. Get your burrito oh, bowl. Take no abuse. Buzzmachine.com. <laughs> Gina Trapani, SmarterWare.org. Kevin Purdy, the author of this great new book, The Complete Android Guide. If you've got Android, you need the book. CompleteAndroidGuide.com. You can follow him on Twitter as well. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on This Week in Google.